Well, good morning, church. I'm glad you're here today. I hope you had a wonderful week. I know this was a holiday week. A lot of you were traveling. I hope that it was a very productive time for you. I hope you had a, a good chance to visit with family. Those are uh, those moments in life where great memories are made and uh, where you're able to really share love with each other as a family. And I hope that that was a blessing to you. Uh, if you would, please open your Bible this morning to James chapter 1 as we worship God through the Word of God. Some of you are hoping maybe we were done with James, and we got one more week of it this morning. Uh, one of the best books that I have ever read is a book by James D.G. Dunn called The Theology of Paul. And uh, it's a book that highlights and really dives very, very deeply into the writings of the Apostle Paul. And I had a friend one time who was taking a class, and one of the books they required for the class was this particular book I'm telling you about. And I remember he, he just kind of, he had the book out before him, and he showed it to me, he said, man, the title of this book is dumb. He said, as if Paul had his own doctrines. Because that's what the title means, the teachings of Paul, or the doctrine of Paul. And, uh, I, you know, I just kind of listened to him. I wanted to hear him out a little bit. But I, I think on one, on one hand, it makes sense. Paul didn't have a series of teachings that were different necessarily from anything else in your New Testament. He didn't have a series of teachings that were contradictory in any way to the rest of the New Testament. But, but isn't it true that, that each biblical author has his own set of things that he emphasizes. Isn't that true? I think any time that we read through a book of the Bible, we notice, don't we? Uh, whether we're reading through a gospel account, even the four gospel accounts have their own emphases as you read them. John emphasizes certain things. The deity of Christ, for example. Matthew emphasizes the Messiahship of Jesus. Luke emphasizes how Jesus reaches out to the have-nots of the world. Each one of these authors has his own set of ideas that he really wants to emphasize and highlight. And James is no different. As we've studied through the book of James, some things we have noticed, it all revolves for James around the idea of wisdom. James wants us to know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, how to live our lives wisely before God. He wants us to understand how to please God in the way that we live our lives and in the way that we obey God. And as we've, as we've been studying through the book of James, and now we, you know, last Sunday morning, we actually finished out that particular study in the book of James in the text itself, I want us to do something just a little bit different here this morning. You ever heard that expression, you can't see the forest for the trees? You ever, you ever heard that expression before? Sometimes you can get to examining one leaf or one branch, or even just one tree so closely that you miss the effect of stepping back and looking at the whole tree line, looking at the whole forest. And what I want us to do with James this morning is exactly that. I want us to think about taking a step back, not looking necessarily at individual trees in the forest, but rather just getting sort of a, a scope of everything that's in the book of James and just sort of highlighting some very, a couple of very, very important things, and then we'll highlight a very essential verse as we close out here, here this morning. James is very, very concerned with the idea of what does wisdom look like? Can I ask you a question? What does wisdom look like in your life? What, what are things that you've seen or you know, ways that you have had access to wise counsel throughout the scope of your lifetime? What are some ways that you have really encountered wisdom? For some of you, it may be the case that you had a very, very wise father or maybe a very, very wise stepfather. And that person really uh, helped you or maybe an uncle who was always really, really good at giving advice. Maybe it was uh, a grandfather. You know, you, you have in families patriarchs a lot of times, right, we might call them. Individuals that we really look up to, and we really seek their counsel because we know they are what? 
we know they are wise. They're wise individuals, and because they're wise, we want to know how to live, or, or maybe the answer to some kind of question that we have in our lives. Maybe that is what wisdom has looked like in your life. Man, I can remember TV shows growing up I, that were subtly, had these very wise messages. You ever, you ever go back as an adult and watch Lips on the Prairie? Man, I enjoyed that. My girls discovered it, I guess, about four years ago. And uh, kind of at that age, you know, I guess I was probably when I watched it as a kid too. And when you go back as an adult and you watch shows like that, you're like, man, this, this show's got some pretty wise counsel in it, right? Where's the TV like that now? I don't know. You, you can't really seem to find it as much. Imagine the wisdom required to hold a church together. When you got individuals within a congregation who have very, very strong opinions about this thing or, or that thing or whatever it may be, and, and then you have to evaluate and you have to deal with that problem in such a way that peace reigns the day and that maturity uh, brings people together. That's not always an easy thing, and it requires wisdom. What is wisdom? That's the question we're asking. And that's the question James is asking. I think it's an important question to ask, especially as we enter into a new year. You know, uh, tonight is uh, New Year's Eve. That's right, right? I'm not off. Okay. And tonight we have a New Year's Eve gathering after our evening service. We'll have some finger foods and we'll have some games that we play. Great chance for fellowship, that sort of thing. Uh, it was 15 degrees driving out here this morning. Did y'all happen to notice that? And... Uh, you know, it, it may be worse tonight, but we'll be in here and we'll be very warm. But you know, tomorrow starts a new year. And that sort of starts this, this new idea that we have, a newness of life that we, we kind of think about every, every new year. You have this idea that you're going to uh, have these resolutions on how to better yourself in a new year. Well, I'm not really concerned with that. I'm not really that interested in setting resolutions. What I am interested in, in knowing is how I can enter this new year with better wisdom on how to live out my life. And I want us to think about that. I think James will challenge us in that way here this morning. You've got an outline, don't you? On the inside of your bulletin, there's a, an outline whereby you can follow along. I want to highlight two very important big picture ideas that James is, is kind of telling us as we take a step back and look now at the forest rather than the trees, I want to see these two really big principles that James is teaching us. And, and right before we close, we'll look at uh, uh, really specifically what James thinks wisdom looks like uh, from a particular verse, okay? So, so here's the first thing that's a big picture item that James is teaching us in this book. Number one, he gives us Faith for our present. And the idea with this is that James communicates over and over and over again that our faithful God is for us. Amen? Our faithful God is for us. Now that's an important picture for us to have in our minds. It's an important idea for us to live by for a number of reasons. I'm wondering... What was the imagery of God that you grew up with? What was the idea of God that you grew up with? Have you ever noticed, I've, I've noticed things like that, have you ever noticed how people over the years have tried to depict God in art? Not always my favorite thing, because I think a lot of times when people try to depict God through paintings or drawings, I think they really probably... Uh, you know, should be very careful about how they do that. And over the years, I've seen some of those pictures from what I would consider the ridiculous, okay? From the ridiculous to the mysterious to Michelangelo's uh, infamous muscular, you know, grandfather in the sky image. But maybe the main idea that we have of God as we, some of us grow up, because we hear a lot of these stories of God's judgment and wrath, and they're very real is the idea of an angry God. That just at the, 
you know, the, the slightest offense, he becomes enraged. What I want you to see is that James gives us very, very positive imagery of our God as we look through this particular book. It doesn't mean he doesn't have judgment. He does have anger and wrath and judgment at appropriate moments. But as he deals with his children, our God is a God who is a loving Father at his core. And I want to invite you to kind of look with me at some verses that show that to us in the book of James as we look at it together. James draws from a lot of Old Testament images about God. And why, why shouldn't he? What does Romans 15.4 say about our Old Testament? It says that it's there for our what? It's there for our learning. It's there to educate us about who God is and what God is all about and the big picture of what He's trying to do. And so James is using mainly these positive images of God. So look at James 1.5. For example, we find God who if we ask of Him, He gives generously to all without, a, without reproach. That's the kind of God that we have. Or, or what about James chapter 1, verse 27? Look there where James echoes Jesus in calling God the Father. Or what about James 1, 17? One of the best verses in the whole book of James where in verse 17 it says, every, get this, every good gift... And every perfect gift is from where? It's from above. It's from God. God is the... Hey, are you listening? God is the inventor of generosity. God is the one who came up with the idea of generosity. And notice in verse 17, the second phrase, where those good things come down from the Father of lights above. You know what that means? That means our good God, our faithful God, is the creator of all things. That's a positive image of God. This past week I came across a very interesting picture from the Hubble telescope. You know about the Hubble telescope. And it's from, let me double check this, this is called the Eagle nebula where this is located i don't know where the eagle nebula is if i looked up at the sky at night i couldn't point you in one direction or the other but i know they took this this image of of clouds of of gas that were you know kind of forming out there and that's that's amazing for me to think about that our god is the father of lights above and he made this expanse of the heavens to demonstrate how awesome and how great He truly is. And then in your verse 17, notice the last part of that verse where He says, with whom, that is God in God, there is no variation and no shadow of turning or no shadow of change. Can I tell you something I'm really glad about? I'm really glad that our God doesn't change. Because our God doesn't change, it means He's trustworthy. It means that when He makes a promise... He's going to keep that promise. And that's something for us to behold. Because of who He is, He will give you the crown of life, verse 12. He has promised to those who love Him. And then notice in chapter 2 and verse 5, another image of the trustworthiness of God, where He says that those who belong to Him are the heirs of the kingdom which God has promised to those who love Him. And then look in James 2.19 and you'll notice, you'll notice this center confession of who God is. God is one. He is one. He's utterly reliable. He is utterly trustworthy. Now when we get a good picture of who God is, the truth of the matter is who He is now becomes the standard for how we're going to live our lives. So now when we look in passages like, look in your Bible at chapter 1 and verse 20, and we look at encountering human anger, for example. Now God is the standard for how to evaluate human anger when we encounter angry people, or when we ourselves become angry. God becomes the standard for that. If you look in 127, James teaches us in chapter 127 that rather than being angry, 
going around being angry all the time, which just gets us in trouble with other people and gets us in trouble with God, what God would rather we do is to take care of each other. Isn't that, isn't that a great solution? That's a great solution rather than being angry at people all the time just to take care of each other. Now in chapter 2 and verse 5, another positive image, God takes up the cause of the poor against the rich. And He hears the cries of people who are oppressed. This is the main theme in James. I had a whole lesson I was going to preach on it, but we ran out of time in the book in the month of January. I read an interesting story, though, along these lines from chapter 2 and verse 5. Um, Some time back. And it was about a, a guy who was a homeless guy. And he... It's a true story, apparently. He, he visited a, a congregation down, down in Florida. He entered into the congregation. He sat in the back. Someone did one of those legendary things that you hear people doing. I've actually witnessed this one time in my entire ministry. I thought it was a legend where somebody came over to him and said, you're sitting in my seat. <laughs> and, and, and he experienced that on this particular morning. He said nobody wanted to talk to him. Nobody was interested in helping him. He asked one individual, could he see somebody about uh, maybe buying him some food today? Taking him to lunch? They said, we'll be right back. And they never came back. (laughs) He said it was a terrible experience. But about as the service was, was ending and the announcements were being given... Jeremy, uh, Jeremiah Stepak got up from the back row, walked down to the front, and announced himself as their next preacher of that particular congregation. Unknown to the church, he had been in conversations with the eldership. The eldership did not even recognize him on this particular morning because of the way he was dressed and because of his beard. And the people were absolutely shocked because they looked at this guy Nobody had dealt with, nobody wanted to talk to, nobody wanted to help. And guess what? Guess what his sermon was about the very next week? It was about generosity and kindness and helping people. You see, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And James says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. So God's goodness, it steadies us during the difficult moments of our lives. If you look in chapter 2 and verse 23, uh, James shows us that friendship with God is actually possible. I, I want to be considered by God, not just His servant, not just an obedient disciple. I want Him to see my relationship with Him as, as being like Abraham's, where Abraham was called God's friend. And James is saying, that's a possibility for my life and for yours. And it's something that we should seek out because of who God is. Now if you're daydreaming, I want you to come back for this last verse for this first point and notice James 4 and verse 5. It's a very powerful verse and I love it. Look at what it says. James says, do you suppose that there's no reason that the Scripture says, now watch these words, that God yearns jealously over your spirit. You know what that means? Let me tell you something. That might be one of the best invitation verses I have ever come across in my life. God yearns jealously over your spirit. You know what that means? That means God will not rest until you belong to Him. God will not rest. He does not want to rest. He yearns jealously over you because He loves you because that's the kind of God that we have. So, very first thing I want you to see that James paints for us in this broad picture is that our faithful God is for us. But there's a second general principle I want us to look at and it's this, write it down, that our obedience brings blessing. Our obedience brings blessing. I used to, uh, years ago on my desk I had a plaque 
that somebody are, what are those things called where they sit on a desk, they're not a plaque, but they're, I forget what they're called, they, you know, just, I don't know how to say it any differently, you know, you sit it on your desk, it's got a little saying on it, right? And somebody had gone out and made one for me, and what it said was, how I treat you helps determine how you treat me. There's a lot of wisdom in that, isn't there? <laughs> the reason they made that plaque, that little whatever it's called, <laughs> on my, for my desk was because I preached a sermon one time. And that was my main idea. Where I just said from Scripture, how, how I treat you helps determine how you treat me. There's some echoes there of the golden rule, right? You can find echoes of a lot of teachings from Scripture there. How I treat you helps determine how you treat me. Put that to the test this week. Go into a store and find somebody who works there, who's very, very rude to you, and what's your natural reaction to that? What, how do you want to react to that? You, you get angry, don't you? And you want to speak to a manager or whatever it is that you want to do. There are all kinds of ways that we encounter this in our everyday lives. It's very true at home. It's very true with your spouse. It's very true with your children, your co-workers. How I treat you helps determine how you treat me. Now, I bring that up because of this. That's also true with God. How we treat God helps to determine how He treats us. Now, isn't that right? How we treat God helps to determine how He treats us. This past, this past week, uh, out on Trotwood, in front of that little, you know, before you get to Neely's, Neely's Mill, you know that, uh, that little store they never can keep a restaurant in? I think it used to be a Dairy Queen way back before I came to town. But you, you never can keep, keep anything in there. And right there, there's a bridge, like a little concrete bridge, you know, just about, I don't know, 25 feet long. And somebody apparently had run into the edge of the guardrail. This is not the actual place, by the way. It's just a picture of a guardrail. So don't try to place that here in town. But somebody had run into the end of the guardrail and had destroyed part of the guardrail. And man, you can't, you know how traffic on Trotwood is already a disaster. You can imagine what that did to traffic, right? Now, let me ask you a question. Why, are guard, why do guardrails exist? Guardrails exist for a number of reasons, right? They exist to to keep us safe. They exist to kind of keep us in the road a little bit too, right? To help us from, from disastrous things happening. God has placed, listen, God has placed guardrails in our lives. He has taught us wisdom through His Word to keep us between the lines, to bless our lives, to keep disastrous things from happening. And we need those guardrails, don't we? And here's what James calls guardrails like that. If you'll look in your scripture at chapter 1, verse 25, where we look at guards, uh, God's guardrails as a perfect law. He calls it the law of liberty. That seems, that seems weird to say a law of liberty, right? But, but God's, here's the thing about God's law actually frees us from being bound to sin and bound to things in our lives that are destructive. And some of those ways that God expects us to obey, one of the big ways God expects us to obey is in the way that we treat each other in the church. In fact, all of chapter 4 is basically about that. It's about making sure to overcome strife and overcome controversy, overcome threats to harmony in the body of Christ. And one of the ways that James does this is he uses these vivid images to illustrate his points. Walk with me through some of these and just think of the imagery that, that James paints. Look in chapter 1 and verse 5 and notice that a disobedient person, James calls it an indecisive person. He says, they're like a person who's like a wind-tossed wave out on the sea. They have no anchor to hold them in place. That's a vivid image. Or what about the image of disobedience in chapter 1 and verse 9, where the rich are like this withering flower as the sun beats down on it? 
Or what about chapter 1 and verse 17 where it says our God doesn't change like the shadows turn and move as the sun moves through the day. Or what about chapter 1 and verse 23 where James says when we disobey, it's like looking in a mirror having read God's Word and the minute we walk away from the mirror, we forget what it was that we just saw. A lot of people, he says, disobey in that regard. Just that way. They read God's Word and they walk away and forget all about it. Or what about the illustration of chapter 3 and verse 3 where he says, the tongue is like a bridle to the entire direction of your life. And obedience or disobedience in this one area makes a huge difference. He uses a, a, a similar illustration in verse 4 where he says it's like a rudder that controls a ship. Or, or maybe like a wildfire burning out of control. Or what about chapter 4 and verse 14 where he, he uses this image. He says life is like a brief and vanishing mist. So our responsibility is to be obedient, James is saying. Or what about this picture, this beautiful picture of faith that James has where he says it's like planting seed and it takes some time, but crops come from that. A harvest comes from the planting of that seed. So overnight, I got, you know what I think? I think I would have loved to have heard James preach. <laughs> With illustrations like that, those are powerful images that James brings to our eyes. And he uses those to illustrate the difference between obeying and disobeying. All right, so what I want to do right here as we get ready to, to close is I want to highlight now a central verse in James where James talks about what it looks like to live wisely. I want to close out on this one single verse, chapter 3, verse 17, which you heard, I think it was Randy read uh, a little bit ago, chapter 3, verse 17. And I want you to look at yourself. Hey, let's use James' own image, shall we? Where you use James 3.17 as a mirror. And look at yourself. And don't walk away from it and forget what you see, okay? And you'll notice on, on your outline, I've got these lettered, these items lettered A, B, C. Uh, you can write those down if you like, but I'm going to be running through those very, very quickly. I want to look at the verse right now. It says, verse 17, chapter 3, the wisdom from above. What is it, James? Well, it's first, what? Pure. Write this down at letter A. What, what James says wisdom looks like is that we're to be people who protect our purity. That's the first thing that he highlights in verse 17. In a culture where, you know, I'm scared to let some of my, I, I, I'm, I'm scared for my daughters to see some of the, you know, even the commercials that come on television anymore. I'm frightened for them. You know, they're going to learn a lot just by watching commercials. That's the kind of culture in which we live right now. And in the midst of that kind of world, James challenges us that if you really want to be obedient to this loving God, then you start out by being pure. And the second thing he highlights is, he says you ought to be people who stand for peace. Verse 17, wisdom from above is first pure and then peaceable. Man, James has so much to say about people who are quick-tempered, people who love to argue. And this is right in line with that. And then at letter C, he says you ought to respond. Be people who respond with kindness. And the way James communicates that is to say, gentle and open to reason. You ever have one of those conversations with somebody and as you're talking to them, you can tell they're not listening to you. They're thinking about how they're going to respond. <laughs> They're not really open to reason, are they? James says, be gentle, be open to reason, and then, letter D, it's easier for you to forgive mistakes because we all make them. Notice how James says it in verse 17. He says, open to reason and full of mercy. You forgive mistakes. That's what living wisely looks like. And letter E you're engaged in doing good for others. I'll never forget, I had, a, I had a teacher years ago by the name of Johnny Ramsey. He was a preacher from Texas. And I used to call him and he'd give me advice. 
And he told me one time, he said, he said, when you encounter, this is a crazy, I've never given, I've never used this advice, by the way. I just want you to know that on the front end of this story, I've never used this advice. But he said he had this one lady in church, and she would call him every single week to complain about her life. And the way things were going, she was in, incredibly negative. And no, no counsel that he gave, no verse that he shared ever helped. And finally, one day she called and he, he said to her, Sister so and so, he said, Do you know anybody in your life who's got life worse than you? And she said, Well, well, I suppose this person and that, they've got some pretty pressing issues going on. And he said to her on the phone, okay, he said, Maybe what you ought to do is instead of complaining about your own life, go bake them a cake and take it to them. He said she just lit on fire on the other end of that line. I imagine she did. And started, you know, getting very huffy and angry with him. And he said, just take my advice and go do it. And they kind of abruptly ended the conversation, as you can imagine. And she saw him. He was, he was impressed. He saw her at worship the next Sunday, and she walked up to him. She still looked a little mad, but she said, you know what? I took your advice, and he said, she said, and it actually worked, and I feel better. <laughs> it's astonishing that when we take into account the teaching of James and take into account living wisely, it can change your perspective. So he says, full of mercy and good fruits, and then the last part of the sentence in verse 17, you live with integrity at letter F, full of mercy and good fruits, and the way James says it is you're impartial and you're sincere. Literally, you're without disguise. You're without disguise. Well, let's close out with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you today for this word from this last overview of your servant, James. We thank you for the wisdom that you've taught us in your word, Father. We pray that we can behold it make it real for our lives to not walk away from the mirror and forget, but rather to see it and to live it and to make the necessary changes. Father, we thank You for this church and we thank You for this study that we've had and we pray that You will help us today uh, to endeavor to live more wisely. It's in the name of Jesus we pray it. Amen. Well, i got a challenge for you, as I normally do on Sunday mornings. It's at the end of your outline. Hey, I want you to take 317, James 317. And this week, I want you to block off a little time and evaluate yourself in each of these areas. You, you know one way you can do that <laughs> that might be productive? is to sit down with your spouse and ask them, how am I doing on this? Just be prepared for what they might say, okay? But it's one way that you could kind of get that spiritual conversation going. Think about ways you need to improve. And think about areas that you're finding change happening. Well, this morning we've looked at what it means to be wise in James' writing and in the eyes of God. Maybe you're living your life in such a way that's not very wise, to be quite honest. Maybe... Maybe you need to come back to, to God. Maybe you need to start living according to the will of God a little more closely. Maybe you need, I don't know, I don't know your story. Maybe you need to become a follower of Jesus this morning. And you know, Jesus' last command must be our first priority. Go and make disciples. How, Jesus? Baptize them. Teach them. We can help you with that process here this morning. Whether it's in becoming a follower of Jesus or whether it's realigning your life with the wisdom from above. Let's stand and sing about it. Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I 